Good morning, and thank you for the lovely introduction and also for singing together and reading the Magnificat and praying. Basically, we could go home right now. We've done it. But we will talk about Mary. In the first lecture, we established that a ghostly, docetic Jesus undermines the good news of the gospel. The way we envision Jesus, follow him, talk about him, has material consequences. Indeed, the negation of the humanity of Jesus often goes hand in hand with expressions of inhumanity. In societies living out the legacy of Christendom, this can be seen especially in the situation of vulnerable subaltern populations. The people Jesus lovingly called the least of these, the little ones, whose full humanity is questioned by the very forces that undermine the materiality of the incarnation. From the beginning of the Jesus movement, one way to counter a docetizing theology has been to anchor the true humanity of Jesus in a particular history, geography, and culture by remembering his mother. Central to the message of the gospel from its earliest transmission was that Jesus did not appear out of nowhere, fully grown and formed. Rather, as Paul put it in Galatians 4.4, I'm defending Paul a little bit after last night, uh, those of you who are here. <laughs> he was born of a woman, came to being of a woman, arose of a woman. Jesus is not only our brother by virtue of our adoption to the status of children by a loving parental God whose spirit empowers us to address God in, a per in perfect confidence and intimacy, Galatians 4, 6 to 7. Jesus is also our brother by dint of his common humanity with us. He, just like us, came from a woman, got our, got our name from a woman, and our game from a woman, to quote Tupac Shakur. <laughs> Thus, not only does Mary matter because Jesus matters, but Jesus matters because Mary of Nazareth matters. Mary was made of matter. Mary was a woman of flesh and, and bone. Mary was a human being. In the Divine Comedy, Dante Alighieri reminds us that the face that most closely resembles Mary, I mean, Christ, is Mary's face, or the face that most closely resembles Mary is Christ's face, I guess you could say. In Canto 32 of the Paradiso, Heaven, the last section of the epic poem, Dante, guided by Saint Bernard, glimpses Mary. Quote, look now upon the face most like to Christ, because its brightness all alone possesses the power to prepare you to see Christ. Just afterwards, in the culmination of the epic poem, as his eyes slowly adjust to the light, Dante perceives three large circles, wheels within wheels, deep and bright, each equally occupying the same space, representing the Trinity. Within the exalted light of those spheres, and without them losing their shape, he makes out what seems to be a form in the image and likeness of a human being, Jesus Christ. You can't see that in the middle of those circles of the illustration. <laughs> We're not where Dante was, I guess. We can't quite focus. But in the middle, he could see this human figure. In striking poetic fashion, Dante shows us the centrality of the incarnation. For even in the most sublime and radiant light of God, the humanity taken on by Jesus is not effaced. That humanity is anchored in Mary. And as Dante reminds us, it looks more like Mary than it does like anybody else because she was his mother. The theological doctrine of Mariology is indeed a vital conversation partner for Christology, though it has been too often ignored and suppressed by Protestantism writ large. I remember as a young person in Argentina when I told people where I went to church, and that I wasn't Roman Catholic, they would say, ah, ustedes son los que no quieren a la Virgen. 
Oh, you are those people who don't love the virgin. <laughs> and in some ways, that description was apt. A lot of our identity was premised on not being similar to Catholic popular religion, not focused on the saints and on Mary, not having any images of her, in, indeed any images at all, in our churches. Even having a little wooden cross was, you know, considered to be too much. We simply did not deal very much with Mary. I loved Mary Magdalene because she was the disciple who preached the resurrection to the apostles. I loved Mary of Bethany because she was a theologian who sat at the feet of Jesus to learn. But the Virgin Mary, she seemed like a trap for women. I mean, who could be both a mother and a virgin at the same time? How could that be any kind of example for me? In time, I came to appreciate some of Marian piety through my female Roman Catholic colleagues in theology in Argentina, who were strong women of faith, who followed Jesus and loved Mary. But I still didn't see what Mariology had to do with my own theological task. It finally dawned on me that I too needed to think through Mariology a decade or so ago, when I was teaching a workshop on Christology to some Methodist ministers in Mexico City. Mary seemed to keep budding insistently into our conversation, though I had not invited her. <laughs> the students wanted to know what I thought about her, and especially about the devotion to the Virgen de Guadalupe in Mexico and beyond. Was she to be ignored, rejected, accepted? How? And in the conversations, not in the workshop, it was interesting to me how the male pastors would talk about how great their moms were and how well they cooked and things like that. It was interesting because maternalism was in the, in the mix of the conversation as well, not just Mariology. I realized I didn't really know the answer to their questions. I didn't have a sufficiently developed theoretical framework for understanding what Marian devotion all over Latin America was capable of communicating. Slowly, I began to realize that my beloved Christology itself is not complete without a careful consideration of Mary. So in this second lecture, we'll explore a slice of Mariology, specifically how and why Mary matters for a non-docetic, life-giving, liberating Christology. In thinking about Mary, we're immediately faced with a conundrum quite similar to that which Christology faces in thinking of Jesus. Mary is a hu is Mary, question, is Mary a human being just like the rest of us or not so much? What does that mean in view of the wider problem of the ghostly, docetized Jesus that concerns us? In the New Testament, Mary is first of all the guarantee of Jesus' true and full humanity. I see. Yeah. She's presented as a thoughtful, down-to-earth woman, clearly well-versed in the liberating traditions of the Hebrew faith, as we heard today in the Magnificat, in the, in the passage that was read. Rightfully concerned about the well-being of her unusual son, Matthew and Luke both include stories about the birth of Jesus and Mary's role in it, which are the ones we tend to focus on and usually romanticize in our Christmas celebrations. It was a, a rather unnerving to me to see my young daughters take on the role of Mary in the Christmas pageant that we always have, you know, and to realize, oh my goodness, you know, they're 13, 14 years old could be pregnant, like Mary was, right? She was very young as well. Um, also interesting is that in our church, the very first role you ever take on as a baby is that of Jesus, because the youngest baby gets to be Jesus at the Christmas pageant. So how is that for, you know, theological statement about the importance of children? Matthew is particularly interested in Joseph, whose genealogy he includes at the beginning of his gospel, 1, 1 through 17. I know we kind of skip over that stuff, but notably, in that genealogy, uh, we find a kind of intertextuality that makes reference to strong female figures. Matthew highlights women like Tamar, Ruth, and Bathsheba. Uh, 
And at the end of his recitation of the family line, he identifies Joseph as the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called a Christ. It's interesting. Matthew also includes a tantalizing hint about the escape of the Holy Family to Egypt, seeking safety from a hostile political regime, and the family's subsequent return to the Galilean region of Palestine, Matthew 2, 19 through 23. This journey has enlivened the imagination of artists for centuries, perhaps because the flight from persecution is such a widespread human experience. The flight to Jesus points to another dimension of Jesus' full humanity, his fragility and vulnerability to the forces of empire, which do indeed finally succeed in executing him, though not in putting an end to him or to his story. Luke speaks of Mary as Maria. Luke 127, the name used in the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible, to speak of the prophet Miriam, the sister of Moses. You can look at that in Micah 6.4. Though her name, through her name, and through his rendering of her joyful song of praise, the Magnificat, Luke links Mary not only to the multitude of Jews, Jewish women of, of her own time called Miriam, or Mary, but also to the great tradition of women prophets from Miriam to Deborah and Hannah. Miriam the prophet with a tambourine in her hand leads the Hebrew women in a joyful dance, singing praises to God for the liberation of her people, Exodus 15, 20 to 21. Deborah the prophet, Judges 4, 4, likewise sings a song of triumph of her people in the face of their enemies and praises God May those who love you be like the sun when it shines at its brightest. Judges 5.31. Hannah is a woman of faith who prays in her time of distress and is heard by God. Her prophetic song of praise, as recorded in 1 Samuel 2.1-10, is the template for the Magnificat, and like Mary's song, is traversed by themes of justice. God raises up the poor from the dust. God lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes and inherit a seat of honor. 1 Samuel 2.8. In Luke's narrative, Mary is also closely connected to two women contemporary to her who speak as prophets. Her kinswoman Elizabeth, Luke 1.42-45, and Anna, the daughter of Phanuel, who serves in the temple, Luke 2.36-38. Mary is willing to act on her conviction that nothing is impossible with God and so is open to serving God as best she can, Luke 138. She ponders and reflects on the events surrounding the earthly life of Jesus and presumably later will contribute to the sources that Luke consults in putting together his gospel. Luke is considered the patron saint of painters in European art, and he's often depicted as painting Mary with a baby Jesus. In the story about the wedding at Cana in the Gospel of John, Mary also speaks, first directly to Jesus, to point out that they're running out of wine, John 2, 3. I loved this story as a kid because of my teetotaling parents <laughs> living in a country which is one of the you know, largest wine producers in the world. Jesus drank wine. Mary then tells the server, whatever he says to you, do it, John 2, 4. We then see that Jesus, by providing wine where only water was available previously, is able to perform a messianic sign that blesses human joy, love, and celebration. As attentive readers, we know that in John's gospel, he is the word made flesh, and as such, he is able to show us something profound about grace and truth, John 1.17. He continually makes clear that his mission is about God's commitment to human life in abundance, John 10.10. But what we sometimes forget if we read Mary's word in chapter two only as a general indication that the church should look to Christ, 
is that in the wedding of Cana, she's also making a point about his and our humanity. It is a wedding, the time of merriment. And as part of that celebration, it makes sense to make a toast to the newlyweds with good wine. It's not only a sign of the Lord's Supper to come or of the eschatological banquet, but of the life of human beings among friends, celebrating the union of two people right here, right now. As Mercedes Navarro says, in this exchange, Mary resituates, resitua, Jesus in a concrete historical moment. That is a good way to describe the primary role of a strong, grounded Mariology. Mary resituates Jesus in his full humanity and thus serves as a bulwark against a docetized Christology. Mary is not glamorized in the New Testament, but rather appears as a strong woman of the people, capable of questioning Jesus if necessary, while also trusting in his capacities. Indeed, Mark isn't afraid to imply that Mary is doubtful about the wisdom of the way Jesus is carrying out his ministry, if you look at Mark 3. In John, we find Mary present both at the beginning of his ministry, at the marriage of Cana, in John 2, and at the end, standing by the cross, John 19. Our last, last glimpse of Mary in the New Testament is in Acts 1.14, where we find her preserving, pre, persevering, not preserving, persevering in prayer along the 11 remaining apostles, the female disciples, and her other children, Jesus' siblings. Starting very early indeed, however, the theological tradition began to paint Mary as something other than exclusively and entirely human. She began to be depicted as the ever Virgin Mary, a woman who somehow retained her physical virginity despite being married and giving birth both to Jesus and his siblings. The brothers and sisters of Jesus are mentioned in the New Testament explicitly, and we even know the names of some of his brothers namely James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas, Matthew 13 and Mark 6. Nonetheless, as the idea of the ever-Virgin Mary began to circulate, her other children began to be understood either as the children of Joseph by an earlier marriage, that's why you see those depictions of him in art as an old, old guy, because he also drops off the face of the earth, right, and we never hear about him again after the early stories, so he must have been very old. Or maybe they were the cousins of Jesus. Some early theologians, though, such as Tertullian, third century, pushed back at such ideas. He says, indeed, you remember he was vigorous yesterday and he's vigorous today in this quote. He, she is rather to be called not virgin than virgin, having become a mother by a sort of leap before she was a bride. Why need we discuss this further? In stating on these considerations, not that the Son of God was born of a virgin, but of a woman, the apostle acknowledges the nuptial experience of the open womb. Nevertheless, the erasure of the flesh and blood, Mary of Nazareth continued. She became less and less a human being like any other. Not only was she imagined as somebody who gave birth without any physical changes to her virginal state, and who never had sex with her husband. To the idea of her physical ever virginity was soon added the notion of her immaculate conception. Macula means stain in Latin. So the idea was that her parents conceived her in an un untainted way. This of course implies erroneously in my view that there's something tainted to begin with in the sexual act that leads to most human conceptions. Finally, quite late, came the Catholic dogma of her assumption, the idea that she did not die a death like other human beings, but a bit like Elijah was received directly up into the heavens. In other words, rather than Mary serving as an anchor of the true and full humanity of Jesus, what happens is that she herself is increasingly, increasingly docetized and imagined as a quasi-transcendent ghostly being. As Elizabeth Schuster de Fiorenza puts it, Mary is mythologized far beyond any historical resemblance 
in ways very similar to Jesus. We end up with the thoroughly docetized Mary, Queen of Heaven. What then are we to make of the Marian Theotokos, meaning the bearer of God or the mother of God? It might be argued that this title is also intrinsically docetizing, but the matter is more complex than it might seem at first glance. Mary was the mother of Jesus, and because Jesus Christ is seen as fully divine as well as fully human, it can be said that she bore a human being and also bore God. The title Theotokos can be translated literally as the one who gave birth to the one who is God. It is not meant to imply that she's the eternally existing mother or source of the Godhead, but rather that she was the mother of the incarnate one who is both a human being and, of, and is God. Strictly speaking, then, Theotokos is a Christological title as much or more than it is a Mariological one. By the same logic, she was also Christotokos, the mother of the Christ, though that title was pushed to the side because some early theologians thought that those who espoused it expunged the true divinity of the Son. She could equally be called the Anthropotokos, or mother of the human being, Jesus. It is true, of course, that the mother of any person could be called Anthropotokos, bearer or mother of a human being. So that's a new title for some of us. It was Mother's Day in Argentina last Sunday, so I could say I'm truly Anthropotokos. But only Mary can be called Theotokos, bearer or mother of God. The problem emerges because of largely unspoken assumptions about the meaning of Christ's divine nature, what kind of God is revealed in Christ. Such assumptions whereby the knowledge of what is divine is presumed independently of what is revealed in the incarnation, all too easily led to a process whereby Mary's humanity began to be swallowed up by a divinity presumed to be ultimately incompatible with and even hostile to fleshliness, embodiment, incarnation, materiality. <clears throat> even some feminist approaches that celebrate Mary as a goddess in some form can contribute perhaps unwittingly to her disincarnation by erasing her historical particularity. We are left with a conundrum. Mary matters, but how? Does Mary help or hinder us in the end? as we search to revisit Christology in life-giving ways. To answer this question, I'd like to consult with two of my favorite theologians, one from the English-speaking realm, Julian of Norwich, and one from the Spanish-speaking realm, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz. But first, a drink of water. Julian was an anchorist who lived in Great Britain in the Middle Ages from 1342 to around uh, 1416. An anchorite or an anchoress, to use the female noun, was a woman who committed herself to be anchored to a church, staying permanently in small quarters adjacent to a church building, dedicating herself to prayer and contemplation. Julian would have been able to participate in the mass through a small window that gave onto the sanctuary, and she was able to speak to visitors through another small window that would have given to the exterior. We have, interestingly, the testimony of one of her contemporaries, Marjorie Kemp, who tells of her visit to Julian around 1413, seeking counsel and discernment, for, for which Julian was apparently well known. If you've never read the story of Marjorie Kemp, you really have to read it. It's the craziest thing. The woman cries and cries and wails her way all across Europe. Uh, and interestingly enough, meets Julian in, the, in her itinerary. So Julian was a contemporary of Chaucer. And like him, wrote one of the first books in English vernacular. It's in Middle English, but it's quite understandable. And you know, when you read the story of English literature, she just doesn't appear which is really strange to me because I prefer the revelations to the Canterbury Tales any day. Her book is called The Showings or Revelations of Divine Love and exists in a longer and a shorter version called The Long Text and The Short Text. And it's the detailed explanation of 16 visions of Jesus that she had when she was 36 years, she says 36 and a half, I believe, years old. <clears throat> 
Her theology is both orthodox in the sense of adhering to wider church teachings and expansive in that she focuses so deeply on the kindness, the mercy, and the love of God that she at times cannot see how to reconcile what she perceives of God's character with the sterner side of medieval Roman Catholic doctrine. She's particularly focused on the incarnation and what the incarnation means to her as, a, as she says, simple, unlettered woman, as well as to each of us, especially to those among us who belong to the simple folks, the little ones of Jesus. Julian clearly appreciates the special role of Mary, yet in no way does she depreciate Mary's simple and true humanity. Mary's role is traversed with paradoxes. As a created being, she becomes the mother of her creator. She marvels that God, who was her creator, was willing to be born of her who was created. As a simple young girl, Mary is exalted, though not above the humanity of Christ. For Julian, the humanity of Christ is our baseline, and it is exaltation enough to be truly human, as he was. The incarnation is indeed at the heart of Julian's theology. She has a tender regard for Mary, but what is particularly significant to me is that her Mariological convictions always circle back around to the centrality of the incarnation. An example of this is the theme of motherhood in her theology. <clears throat> Mary's motherhood is not seen as an end in itself, but as a way to arrive at the insight that Jesus is our mother. In other words, for Julian, Mary's motherhood becomes a kind of lens through which to observe the motherhood of the son. There is therefore a way in which we can say that Mary is our mother, but only if we keep the centrality of Jesus in mind. We recognize Mary as our mother inasmuch as we are born of her in Christ. For it is Jesus who is our true mother, in whom we are endlessly born, and out of whom we shall never come to birth, she says. Mary gave birth to Jesus, and as a result, he was able to be fully like us in humanity. By entering as the son of Mary fully into our human experience, he becomes not only our brother in that humanity, but also our mother in his divinity. Julian thus describes the incarnation in Mariological terms without losing sight of the primacy of Christology. As she puts it, because Jesus wanted to become our mother holy and in all things, he undertook the foundation of his work very humbly and gently in the virgin's womb. She adds, our true mother Jesus, he, all love, gives birth to us into joy and to endless life. God loves us and encloses us in God's self, caring for us in every way, <clears throat> coming down to us in our lowest need, and never disdaining or despising any of what God has made, even the simplest tasks and the lowest of our bodily natures. And that includes defecation, she says specifically. God is not ashamed of any part of our lives. Very different from comments made by the executive that lives in the White House right now talking about vulnerable people, and we'll come back around to that contrast. We are soul and body clad and enclosed in the goodness of God, she says. So she understands that true motherhood is in the end an attribute that in its fullness belongs only to God. She says, it cannot truly be said of anyone or to anyone except of him and to him who is the true mother of life and of all things. In Julian's words, Jesus wants us to be his helpers, giving him all our attention, leaning, learning his teachings, keeping his laws, desiring that everything he does should be done, trusting faithfully in him. In other words, Julian sounds kind of like a proto-Anabaptist theologian in this part of the Revelations. We are to learn his teachings, giving him all our attention and trusting faithfully in him. The way of Jesus, his concrete path, are consequently not erased in Jesus' mothering of us 
any more than his humanity was erased in the mothering provided to him by Mary. In one of her visions, Julian sees Mary standing by the cross, high and noble and glorious. Yet even at her highest, the glory of Mary is not to become docetized, but to stand steadfastly at the foot of the cross. Julian believes that God wants us to join Mary at the foot of that cross, and so pass on to God through contemplation. What stands out to Julian as she contemplates Mary in the, moment, in the moment of the crucifixion is her compassion, literally her suffering with. As the mother of Jesus, her sufferings are great, and she is united to him when he suffers. Yet Julian does not set Mary apart from the disciples and from all who truly loved him both then and now. What can be said of Mary for Julian can also be said of us just as what can be said of Jesus can be said of us. There is, in fact, a great affinity between Christ and us. We as human beings, and indeed, she says, all creatures capable of suffering pain, all creatures, she says, even the sun and moon, feel his pain, and he feels ours. Julian provides an excellent model for us as we think of Mary and how she matters. This includes a reflection by Julian about the fact that in the piety of many people, Mary seems to function as an intermediary between God and us. Is it necessary to have an intermediary if we can connect directly to God in Christ? Julian provides a typically paradoxical answer to this question. God allows for both kinds of approaches to God's self. We can come closer to God both through intermediaries and directly. God loves most, she says, that we approach God in prayer directly. But God is delighted also if we employ the help of intermediaries, such as the contemplation of Mary, or of the cross, or of the blessed company of heaven. In Julian words, for in his goodness, God has ordained very many lovely means to help us of which the chief and principal means is the blessed human nature. I meant to mark that in black, but I forgot, I think. Yeah. The blessed human nature which he took from the Virgin, with all the means which went before and came afterwards, which are part of our redemption and our eternal salvation. The incarnation, the blessed human nature of Christ, is thus at the core of God's goodness to us, an incarnation that is anchored in Mary. God rejoices and delights in us as we are, for God became one of us. He who is highest and mightiest, says Julian, noblest and worthiest, is lowest and humblest, the most friendly and the most courteous, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is our brother and savior. For Julian then to remember Mary is to remember the incarnation. And to remember the incarnation is to remember that Jesus has become fully human, one of us, in order that we might participate fully in the life of a kind, compassionate, loving God. As tenderly as Julian loves and venerates her blessed Virgin Mary, there's no docetism in her Mariology as there is no docetism in her Christology. The second theologian who I will call on to help us tease out how and why Mary matters is the 17th century Mexican nun, Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, 1648 through 1695. This is the only depiction of her that we know she herself had seen and approved. It was the, edition of her, the first edition of her, books, her book, her first book in Spain. So she must have looked somewhat like that because she let them publish this. She is better known as a poet than as a theologian, but she was both. Not only because she wrote several explicitly theological texts for which she got into lots of trouble simply because she was a woman writing theology at that time, but also because her poetry is a rich source for theology. Especially in the period between 1576, I mean 1676 and 1691, she wrote many villancicos, poems and short lines, usually of six to eight syllables, used in popular liturgical celebrations. 
They are a way to communicate theological messages in accessible forms through music, theater, stagecraft, and poetry. Sor Juana, interestingly enough, wrote her villancicos not only in standard Spanish, which was the language of the court, but also in Latin, the language of the church, and Nahuatl, the Aztec language, and in Habla de Negros, which was the version of Spanish spoken by Afro-Mexicans. As with Julian, the incarnation and what the incarnation means to each of us is at the center of Sor Juana's Mariology. One welcome aspect of Sor Juana's poems is her sense of humor. In one of her villancicos, for instance, Mary appears as a theologian, a sovereign doctor, soberana doctora, of divine schooling, for whom, from whom the angels in heaven learn wisdom, for she studied the treatise on the incarnation in herself. Mary is thus a greater and more profound theologian than all the great doctors of the church, because her Christology is literally embodied. In a culture and time when women were not allowed to be theologians in any formal sense, even male theologians had to admit that a woman was the greatest theologian of them all. Sor Juana also speaks of the incarnation with great tenderness. The little son of God, Pilsintli and Nahuatl, came down from heaven as our redeemer. Mary gave Jesus his flesh, gave him her milk, and rocked him to sleep. Though we cannot render in European languages the exact tenors of what these diminutives convey in Nahuatl, they suggest the compassionate and tender love of God toward creation and in creation, as well as of Mary toward the child. All four elements come together in Sor Juana's poetry to celebrate the birth of the Christ child. Water, earth, air, and fire. All four elements come to his aid when he is cold, tired, or suffering. As in the emphasis on Mary's motherhood, this matter of the elements is not about a romantic metomony between the feminine and nature, as so often in European romanticism. It functions as an indication that the grounded humanity of Mary and her son point us to our own connection as created beings to vital elements of creation, such as land, water, territory, self-determination, dignity, respect, good living, and Mother Earth. Sor Juana's poetry also reminds us that Mary, who was the face that most resembled Jesus, was not made in the image and likeness of Central or Northern Europeans. Hers was not a visage or body white supremacists and white nationalists would exalt as a standard of white womanhood. It was the face of a young woman who would have fit seamlessly into the masses of refugees and asylum seekers currently fleeing from conflicts in the Middle East, escaping from violence in Central America, or displaced by climate change in Asia. In the face of Mary, we see the face of the poor, the vulnerable, and the oppressed. We see the face of the hungry, the thirsty, the sick, and the prisoners. It is no coincidence that Sor Juana's Mariology is at its most down-to-earth and poignant when she develops it from the perspective of the most vulnerable in her own 17th century colonial society, namely Afro-Mexicans and indigenous Mexicans. In a number of poems, she portrays the mother of Jesus explicitly as a woman of color, illuminated by the rays of the sun, which represent God. In several of the villancicos, Mary is both black and beautiful, like the beloved woman of Song of Songs 1-5. The virgin affirms proudly that she is black and that her blackness is what makes her more beautiful. She is a queen, say these poems, certainly, but she's not white like the Spaniards. As the sun bathes her skin, she becomes ever holier more beautiful and darker skinned. One of the characters in Sor Juana's Villancicos speculates as well that Joseph might have been black, since after all, the queen of Sheba, who was African, was a wife to his ancestor Solomon. So Sor Juana thereby revisits Matthew's genealogy of Joseph, adding one more notable female ancestor to his line. In short, 
<clears throat> Sor Juana is sensitive to the perspective of black and brown Mexicans and reflects in her poetry the tradition of the black and brown Madonna, who is a familiar figure in the form of the Virgen de Guadalupe in Mexico, of the Virgen de la Caridad del Cobre, and the Virgen de Regla in Cuba, and many other representations of Mary in Latin America, Africa, Asia, and in Europe itself for that matter, if we remember the Black Madonna of Poland and the Virgen de Montserrat in Spain, whose uh, images I put there. It is important to pay attention to what these representations of Mary are saying to us about the character of the incarnation, namely, I am not white and neither is my son. If we cast our minds back to first century Palestine, it may seem obvious that neither Mary nor Jesus were what in North America would be called white or white passing today. The force of a whitewashed, ghostly, docetized Jesus is so strong, however, that the potential that the rediscovery of a non-white Jesus and his non-white mother might have for Christian theology is often diluted or ignored. To see why this is important in our present day socio-political context, it is vital to remember how normative whiteness works. I'm speaking primarily now from my own context in the United States, but a similar phenomenon is apparent in many European countries and in countries outside of Europe where there is or historically has been a large white or white passing population, such as Australia, your own Canada, and for that matter, some parts of Argentina. Demographic realities shift over time so that even in countries or regions where so-called whites have been in the majority for decades or even centuries, white people can envision and even project demographically a time when this will no longer be the case due to migration and intermarriage. For, in, for the United States, the year when white or white passing people will move into the demographic minority, it's already happened in some of the states, but for the whole country, it had been projected for the year 2040. And much of what the current administration has done with some success is to try to push that date further into the future by any means possible. Deportation, incarceration, border barriers, rejection of asylum seekers, drastic reduction in the number of refugees accepted, separation of families, and other such policies, both draconian and obvious, such as the caging of children whose families are seeking asylum, and more subtle yet also insidious, such as changing the rules on temporary protected status visas for migrants from countries such as Haiti and El Salvador. So once you understand this demographic reality and realize that the date for white minority has been pushed back to 2045 already, what's happening over there makes a, more sense. What's, what's really behind these moves? And this is the context in which the current U.S. president has spoken of Mexicans as racists and murderers, of Central American, Haitian, and Sub-Saharan African migrants, refugees, and asylum seekers as infesting the United States, and of their countries of origin as depositories of excrement, to say it a bit more elegantly than he did. Historically, those who are considered inferior by the people who hold power or who identify with the powerful, are spoken of as animals, as insects, or even as a kind of virus. In speaking of the situation in Algeria in the 1950s, for example, Franz Fanon pointed out that the colonists, white Europeans, often spoke of the colonized Africans in what he called zoological terms. They accordingly alluded to slithery movements, to odors, to the hordes, to the stink the swarming, the seething, and the gesticulations. This also happened in Argentina when I was a kid, the way that the military regime spoke of so-called communists. It was in terms of a virus that needed to be stamped out for the health of the body. There's a technical term for such discourse, toxification was coined by scholars in genocide studies. Toxification refers to the linguistic pattern that emerges when a group of people begins to be referred to as a kind of vermin that needs to be controlled. 
if they are in the majority, or if necessary, removed by extermination if they are in the minority, supposedly in order to guarantee the health and well-being of a given society. Those belonging to the group portrayed negatively are represented as a toxic present that must be cauterized and destroyed because they carry a noxiousness regarded as irreconcilable, immutable, and inextricable that cannot be remedied by any means other than extermination. The concept of toxification helps make sense of why dehumanizing discourse is not simply insulting, but it's highly dangerous. Historically, it has regularly marked an incipient ethnic cleansing or genocide. For those belonging to a racist white power structure who think of or speak of brown and black people in subhuman ways and treat them in inhumane ways, the thought of a brown or black Mary is tantamount to treason. The brown or black son Jesus, son of the brown or black Mary, brings to light the unspoken connection between a docetized Christ and the ideological use of the Christian faith to justify racist power dynamics. The story of the black Christ painted by Ronald Harrison, who lived 1940 to 2011 in South Africa is a good illustration of this dynamic. Harrison was a white South African painter, and in 1961, after the Sharpeville Massacre, he decided to paint the crucifixion, using faces of people in his society to populate the scene, much as Renaissance, art, uh, Renaissance artists did in Italy, quite often. In 1962, he unveiled this painting, The Crucified Jesus, who was black, bears the face of Chief Albert John Bumbi Lutuli, who died in 1967. Lutuli was at that time the leader of the banned African National Congress. He had written a manifesto proposing nonviolent resistance to the regime, entitled The Road to Freedom is Via the Cross, from 1952. He had received the Nobel Peace Prize in 1960. The two Roman centurions in the by the cross in Harrison's painting, depicted as white men, bear the faces of Prime Minister Fevert and Minister of Justice Foster, who were part of the South African government at the time. Mary is painted as what the apartheid regime called a colored woman, while John the Apostle is depicted as an Asian man. The painting was first presented at St. Luke Anglican Church in Salt River. The regime responded immediately and angrily, calling the painting blasphemous. Harrison was detained and tortured by the security police. The painting was smuggled out of the country, forgotten for a time, and eventually repatriated. And since 1997, it has been housed in the South African National Gallery in Cape Town. Now certainly Harrison's painting constituted a kind of blasphemy, a desecration of the heretical Christianity and the ghostly Jesus of white supremacy. By the same token, the painting points to a deep truth. Christology, in any of its forms, whether visual, poetic, in song, in preaching, in theological treatises, can and should be a force that pushes back against dehumanization and destruction, rather than an ideology that covers up injustice and distracts us from proceeding along the way of Jesus by the Spirit. In order to do justice and to serve mercy, Christology needs systematically and willfully to avoid co-optation by hegemonic forces, in biblical terms by principalities and powers. It needs to pay special attention to the spaces and places where the Holy Spirit is working to bring transformation, healing, and abundant life. As we have seen, a Christology that pays attention to the anchoring of, his, of the true humanity of Jesus and his mother is a Christology that is not as easily distracted by ghostly concerns 
and disembodied spiritualism. So we still lack the third and final lecture in this Jesus Matters series. As we shall see in the end, Christology by itself is not enough. We've established that Christology needs continual grounding in Mary's humanity, and thus it requires close conversation with Mariology. But in order to truly renew itself, in order for us to revisit Christology in life-giving ways, we must turn also to pneumatology, the doctrine of the Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to enable us to proceed along the pathways opened up by Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Mary. And to that, we will turn in the third lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>